Real Men Feel with Andy Grant encourages men to allow and express all of their emotions. Despite what you may have been told, all emotions do serve you. Real Men Feel is committed to engaging in discussions that most men aren't having, but all men can benefit from. If you would like a one-on-one -on -one conversation to help you get clear on what you want in life and what's in your way of getting there, visit theandygrant.com slash talk and book a no obligation, no cost appointment. All links mentioned in each episode are in the show notes found on the blog at realmenfeel.org. Now let's get to it. Hello and welcome to another edition of Real Men Feel. This is your host, Andy Grant. You know, I have always, well, well, not always, uh, for the last decade or so, I've been open about my own mental health challenges and all the ways that I've worked to overcome my own depression and suicidal thoughts. And because we are in such a time of a such deep stress and worry, I believe it is more important than ever to keep such conversations going and out in the open. This, this COVID-19 pandemic brings up so many concerns for health, security, economy, career, and, and more, so much so that anxiety is increasing for everybody, um, to the point that I believe we are in the midst of a mental health pandemic as well. That's part of why I'm really glad to welcome my guest today, networking coach and author of Confident Introvert, Stephanie Thoma. I realize I should have asked you how I say your name. Thoma. <laughs> Tom, Thoma. Yeah, so okay. close. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. That's part of why I'm glad to welcome my guest today, networking coach and author of Confident Introvert, Stephanie Thoma. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. I'm excited to chat with you today. Cool, cool, cool. And so your, your background is, is really, you specialize in decreasing anxiety, building confidence. So you know, those are things that are really taking a hit during this time for everybody, as, as I said in the intro. But were you always a stress-free, confident person? Is that why you got into this? Well, so it's a process, isn't it? Um, getting from point A to point B. So no, I haven't always felt totally free of anxiety or totally confident. And I would even say that it's always a process. but And it's a choice every day to be kind of using those coping skills and uh, and kind of leveraging the skills that we've built up over the years to show up in the way that we want to show up. And so is these coping skills, is this something you had to discover as a child, as an adult? Where, where, did, where did realizing you wanted to be more confident show up? Mm. So I would say it, it kind of began growing up. I was typically on the reserve side in school and I wouldn't talk a whole lot. A common question that I got was, why are you so quiet? Uh, and it, you know, how do you even really answer that question? Maybe more silence seems fitting. And it wasn't until high school when I joined the cross country team where I really resonated with, uh, the more studious sort of reserved nature of a lot of my, uh, my running mates and people identified me differently. They identified me as being extremely friendly and outgoing. And I was kind of confused because I felt like I was being the same person, <laughs> but I was being perceived in a different way. And what I came to realize was that I had built up and was able to express a greater level of confidence. It didn't change where I got my energy from, but it did change how others saw me. Hmm. Hmm. So it was more you comfortable with being yourself and then others kind of felt that shift? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So sometimes it can be a chicken or the egg situation. Do you first love and accept yourself and then others follow suit? Or sometimes our environment can really dictate how we show up. So I was finally in an environment where I felt like I was surrounded by like-minded peers and we had more common interests than I was used to having with peers in social situations. And I think that that really emboldened me and allowed me to, to act in a way that I may have been more likely to act, let's say, at home or with my closest friends. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, since March, I've been encouraging people to kind of use this downtime to, to go within, to explore their, their thoughts, their feelings, their emotions, not to just numb themselves out, right? Not to just Netflix and chill, not to just get drinking, just to drink and get high. Mm -hmm. But when we first spoke, you said something that, that, that I really liked and it was along the lines of, well, I've sat with myself, emotions have surfaced, now what the fuck do I do? Yep. <laughs> so, so you you know, people are home, or a lot of people are still home more than they've been used to. Emotions certainly are coming up. What the fuck do we do? 
Yeah, what, what do we do? Okay, well, <laughs> I would say, first of all, not judging our emotions is so paramount because sometimes when feelings surface, uh, when we numb ourselves to the bad, we numb ourselves to the good as well. So even though right now there's so much in flux, we were talking earlier about the, uh, the, the pandemic itself impacting, of course, many people's health, uh, physically and emotionally, and then the economy and people losing jobs that otherwise felt relatively secure in that sense. So, you know, even people who say, oh, you know, I'm not really impacted. I'm totally fine. I would challenge that and say, well, do you think there's a possibility that on a subconscious level, you're processing the intense changes that are, that are happening in the world? And, and I, I would say that it's that pretty much, it, you'll be hard pressed to find someone who is not impacted in some way. And even um, speaking with friends, family members, clients, uh, a theme that I've seen time and time again is this sort of roller coaster of having some days that feel optimistic, where you wake up and you're like, oh, okay, let's see what today brings. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe walk out into my backyard, do some gardening. It's going to be a good day. And then other days, you just kind of, you know, sleep until the really late morning. And then you're like, okay, what's the point? Like, okay, roll out of bed. And you're going through the motions, not totally in love with life. And, you know, it's, it, it's a matter of being present with what's real for us. And again, back to that point of not judging it and trying, I, I am a huge fan of stoic philosophy. And uh, what the sort of um, pillars of stoic philosophy include observing our emotions and also uh, having a healthy sense of detachment. And this can be a fine line to walk if you, let's say, are not really used to feeling your emotions. You're like, oh, well, so philosophy says not feel them at all. It's not about not feeling them, but it's about observing them and honoring them and not letting them rule the show. Right. So it's, it's it, to me, it's always been about not, not seeing yourself as your emotions. Hmm. Right. Emotions yes. are something I have and I can feel and experience, but, but I'm not them. I love that you brought that up. Yes. Because even in our lexicon, we say, I am mad. I am sad. I am happy. And we can come to identify with our emotional states as being a core part of who we are hmm. when really the bulk of us experience so a spectrum of emotions and um, to allow for that sort of fluidity of these different emotions to kind of come through us and to be like, oh, okay, like this is anxiety or this is sadness. Where is this coming from? And to get curious um, about it and to, and to maybe even change our language around instead of I am anxious, I am noticing I feel anxiety. And, and I like what you're saying about not judging emotions, um, because that's something I definitely always did. And I used to really think I was an introvert too. Now I'm like, is that, is that part of being an introvert? If, if you're always judging your emotions or fearful of people judging your perceived emotions, is that part of that, uh, you know, keeping yourself kind of, kind of dull? Well, so I would say, so a, a big part of, um, my, so what I go into my book, Confident Introvert, as well as my Networking for Introverts workshop, really touches on this whole concept of nature versus nurture and introversion. Uh, and, so, and it kind of reframes the conversation around what it means to be introverted and what it means to be confident. So the example that you just brought up of, uh, you know, feeling this sort of sense of second guessing or wondering how am I being perceived by others, I would say that falls in the category of social anxiety. And that's more under the lens of um, sort of being on the spectrum of where you can be in terms of your personal confidence level. Uh, introversion, on the other hand, so I uh, go by the philosophy of Carl Jung, and he describes introversion as essentially where you get your energy from. And introverts are more likely to get their energy from solitude than socializing. Extroverts are more likely to get their energy from socializing. And it's not a cookie cutter 100% of the time. This is always how it is. You know, there's a term ambivert by Kimball Young. And it basically means that you have access to both introverted and extroverted tendencies. And, and I would truly say that probably 99% of people are actually ambiverts. We all have both in us, unless you're a static cartoon character that's super out there or super reserved. You know, I think of, um, it, it, it's just an opportunity to 
kind of self-identify with one or the other, knowing full well that it it's not one dimensional. Hmm. That's cool. That was one of my questions, but I'm I'm really shocked that it's it's that high. That ninety nine percent are really can can be both operating in both the ambivert. So that's really well, cool. Well, right, and it, it, I guess with Myers Briggs, it's one of those situations where people can fall sort of on the cusp, and let's say you're forty five percent. Uh, extroverted and 55% introverted, you can still identify as an introvert just knowing that you are multifaceted and different days, different <clears throat> emotional states, and different people can bring out different sides of us. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, again, I, I grew up quiet, reserved, shy, so thought that meant I was an introvert. Um, and actually, I dropped out of college to avoid a mandatory public speaking class. And now, you know, I speak, I'm on stage, I do podcasts, and I'm like, oh, have I just changed completely? But yeah, as you said, no, it's, 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 for me, it was more of an issue of social anxiety. It was more of a confidence level as opposed wow. to uh, energy because I can definitely get, get a rush and feel and get from, from people, from a crowd, from that. But I, I can also get, have too much of that and need downtime, need to be alone. So, Absolutely. And I think it also comes from, from being seen and not just seen, but understood. Mm. I think that that can keep some people who are more, who, who are classified as introverted, whether they're naturally introverted or not. Let's just focus maybe on the social anxiety piece that can keep people from speaking out maybe when they would otherwise like to, um, to coming, going to a place where they're able to speak on podcasts, speak on stages. Uh, it, it's kind of overcoming that fear of if I show up in my fullness with all my quirks, will I be embraced for who I truly am? And I know that that kept me smaller for quite some time, just not knowing and not trusting that if I showed up as my full self, that it would be something that was well received. So I thought, well, it's just safer <laughs> to, um, to be a little bit dimmer as you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, being open and authentic has, I've discovered it's a big deal for me and it's a big part of the show. I know authenticity is a big part of, of what you teach and share as well. Um, and I, I love how you phrased it. Are, are, is everybody an introvert until they're kind of comfortable with their authenticity? Hmm. Yeah. So again, I, I would reframe the conversation around um, how an introvert is defined because introverts can get really lit up and excited and show outward passion, uh, when it, even in public settings or in large groups. Uh, so I, I think that a lot of people tend to miscategorize introverts as people who lack confidence or use them synonymously or people that don't enjoy socializing. It's just a matter of where you get your energy from. So, uh, so yeah, I, I would say it's kind of a, a deeper conversation. Um, and culturally as well, um, within the American culture and other cultures, uh, the term extrovert, I've seen, I was actually just watching Indian Matchmaker. <laughs> I don't know if you've gotten on that train yet. I, I typically don't watch TV, but you know, it was one of those things, one of those days this weekend. And uh, I found it really interesting that a term that was used as a positive trait in a match was extroverted. And to me, I think that what they were trying to say is not necessarily they get their energy from people, but they show up in a way that on a surface level looks extroverted. So maybe they have social graces and they're able to, uh, to carry a conversation and, uh, and they are pleasant to be around. I've seen a number of people on, on Facebook say that the, the lockdown aspect of this pandemic is just great for them because they say, I'm an introvert. So just staying at home and not seeing anybody, this is just, this is my idea of heaven. And it, is it if that's true is it healthy so so i would say to me that is a misconception uh, about introversion and lockdown how oh being locked down it's a walk in the park if you get your energy from solitude look you have it 24 seven, you're good. Let's just focus on helping the extroverts out. It's like, you know what? This is a global pandemic. There's, <laughs> uh, there's massive layoffs. There's, it's a whole like mental health crisis. Yeah. And you know, even introverts are having their rough days. So I, I think it's important to really honor that and be aware that even again, like even if you enjoy spending your time reading and writing, and if you 
prefer even to not have the distractions of coworkers coming up to you and asking, you know, interrupting your workflow and, and all of that stuff. Um, it's, yeah, it's still, it, it, there, there pose other challenges because again, just kind of comes this concept of free will. And even if people would prefer to let's say do things in a more solitary way most of the time. I know for myself, I've been working from home for the past five years and it was a part of my routine to work from home just uh, during the day and maybe have a few meetings either virtually or have a lunch meeting and then in the evenings host events. So there was that sense of balance. So I've more or less been doing the same thing minus the, the sort of after part of going out into the world. So yeah, I would say it's such an opportunity for however you identify it, extroverted, introverted, to really get clear on what your values are and how you want to show up in the world now as it currently is. And then when things reopen up, um, what sorts of activities you would like to prioritize or maybe which activities you did prioritize that maybe weren't as authentic to what you truly desire in this life in terms of your social life. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine, especially with, with the definition of getting your energy from solitude or from other people that some people who perhaps thought they were introvert are, you know, drying up at home without, without interaction, without some engagement at some level and discovering that they're, they're, they're more of an ambivert than, than just one extreme or the other perhaps. Absolutely. And even those, the the little things, you know, I, I was on a jog this morning and with masks, it's become customary to not really make eye contact very as often as maybe we used to. Uh, and there's kind of this sub subconscious or very conscious fear of others, right? As we keep um, a good amount of distance, six feet, uh, to be able to you know stay as safe as we can if we're going to be outside. Uh, and eat the little things like jogging by someone and so and her looking over in her mask and saying, hi, I hope you have a great day. The littlest thing that we could really use more of now. Yeah, I, I definitely notice I'm different. I, I don't make eye contact as much. And you, like, mm-hmm. and you could just give a smile to a stranger and now, well, now you're covered up. So right. like, can anyone tell I'm smiling through my mask? I don't know. What's, what's the point? But yeah, it's all I the noticed, smiles. Like, I know, yeah. Like- <laughs> and nobody, nobody wants to make eye contact or, or at least the you know, maybe it's, maybe it is just me. Maybe other people are trying to make contact with me and I'm just staring at their feet. I, you know, I'm not sure, but I definitely, yeah, I definitely noticed that, that I behave differently with, with half my face covered. Yeah. Even at, at the grocery store, like you can see someone that, you know, and I think it's again, um, so I, I was working with people pre pandemic on feeling confident approaching people. And now it's, it's totally different, but some of the feelings are the same. Uh, so I would say, whereas before there would be this sort of feeling of, Oh, will I be rejected? Or do these people even want to talk to me? Uh, and now it's, it can be kind of exacerbated by the fact that people simply aren't looking up. So it's important right now in particular to not take things personally. If hmm. let's say, you know, someone doesn't return your nod or your hello, they could just be in a brain fog days from maybe not leaving their house for two months. We just, we just don't know. So being compassionate towards others and ourselves, and even let's say that unanswered email, it doesn't mean that someone's ignoring you, maybe just taking extra care to check in and come from a place of we're in a pandemic, just reminding yourself, not in a way that stresses you out, but in a way that just puts things in perspective that, uh, that patience is something that we all need for ourselves and others right now. Yeah. I didn't even think of that of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure some networking is happening and people are going out and, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, how different it is to, to approach people and to, to kind of read someone's face when you can't see all their face any longer. Yeah. I mean, I would say, so I have been continuing networking online. I, I don't think it's an ideal time to be networking in person just with heightened anxiety. I mean, networking events aren't really happening. I'm in California and San Francisco, so perhaps they are happening in other places. But, um, but yeah, I would say it was so interesting. The last time that I networked was completely unintentional. I was going to the post office to mail off, um, the first round of my pre-orders, uh, for my book. And, uh, and of course they ask you the customary question. Do you, 
are there any, is there anything, you know, weird going on, any fluids like in these packages? I'm like, no, they're just books. He's like, oh, like, because they're, they're all packaged in purple. So they kind of stand out. And the clerk asked, oh, so what, what kind of books? I'm like, oh yeah, it's, it's my book. I, I wrote a book and I'm shipping, you know, the first shipment out right now. And then someone in line heard me and it was the most interesting interaction because I, I hadn't, you know, networked in the classical sense and used business cards or any of that stuff in, in at least three months. And a woman kind of stepped out of line a little bit and maintained distance and said, Hey, excuse me, local author. <laughs> and then I turn around and she, she was interested in the book. And unfortunately I didn't have extra copies with me. Now I know I need to carry an extra with me at all times, mm. but um, we ended up, I, I said, you know, I'd love to be able to get you a signed copy. So um, I'm like, let me see if I even have my cards anymore. And I looked in my purse and I had them. <laughs> so I, I kind of, you know, real, as quickly as I could, like hand, outstretched my arm, gave her the card. And then we ended up um, connecting online. And it turns out that she lived right next door to me. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, yeah, it, I really think that networking nowadays, and again, uh, or not again, I haven't even said this, but networking is nothing more than friend making as an adult. So I know it can seem really daunting and intimidating uh, and maybe even sterile and cold, but at its best, you're making friends as an adult. We all need jobs to get by in this, in the way that uh, things are structured. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, a, a anyone that has a job or is in the job market, and if you're befriending them or becoming acquaintances, you're networking. Um, so anyway, <sighs> Yeah, it's it's one of those situations where one person going out on a limb, she didn't know how it would react, but she was led by her natural curiosity and what she heard. So she literally stepped out of line and didn't know my name. <laughs> so made a comment um, based on something that she heard. And I've been actually noticing that more and more where if I'm having, having a socially distanced walk with, with a friend on the street, then if if I ask a question, because you do need to speak louder, there are six feet of distance, then a passerby will say, oh, actually that cafe just has limited hours. They're not closed. And, and there may be a little, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. And it's like, no, you're a part of this conversation. Thank you. It's, we all need more of this. Yeah. It was a few weeks ago. I, uh, I was at a supermarket, like one of the only few places you can go. And mm -hmm. I was like, how is wearing my, why is wearing a mask making me deaf? Like, I'm like, oh, yeah. and finally like, oh, because other people's mouths are covered up. It was like, I was, <laughs> I was, I was personalizing everything. Like, what's wrong with my ears? Like, like, oh, yes. But, uh, and that's part of, you know, going back to don't judge your, don't judge your emotions or your senses, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I like how you talk, talk about networking as friend making for adults, because I hear from so many adults, especially men, that they don't know how to make friends as adults. And, especially for, uh, for adults that don't have kids, like as parents, it's usually the children's schools and classes that, that make them mm -hmm. get friends and you, be, you have to become friends with your kids, best friends, parents and stuff like that. So um, I'm sure there are people that saying networking is friend making as an adult that, that brings up just a whole other la layer, layer of dread for it then. Yeah, for some people it, it can be sort of, so it, I find that, that reframe is helpful if someone's underlying fear was inauthenticity. Mm -hmm. So if there's this sort of idea that, oh, networking is so fake and I would like to be successful in my career, but it just feels better to me to submit an application uh, blindly on LinkedIn instead. Uh, so, you know, that, but then it can also bring up stuff to your point of people um, who have had difficulty making friends, let's say in the school days, then re that reframe can bring up another layer. But I also think it's an opportunity to change, to flip the script and change the story because what was true of ourselves growing up doesn't have to be the static way that we always are. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really think that life is all about truly knowing ourselves and having the courage to live in that more fully expressed way. And this isn't to be confused with, oh, you need to be you know, projecting like and speaking as loudly as you can and having that posture and power pose 24 seven. It's just about literally taking those, those moments to check in with ourselves. I love meditation for this. Uh, and meditation, it, it lends a sense of clarity and decision-making. It also allows um, for anxiety to lessen 
so yeah, I, I'd love to hear if you have any more questions specific to friend making, because I think that this is really, this is a great topic. Yeah. So, well, one thing I've often heard is, you know, fake it till you make it and, and mm-hmm. act, act confident, you'll become confident. But, it, you know, I'm, I'm hearing it differently from how you're saying it. And because knowing myself is different from fake it till you make it. Mm-hmm. So Certainly. Do, do they both work for different people or what, what, what do you think about that? So you can only fake it for so long. <laughs> and if it's too fake, it's probably not going to end up becoming real. You know yeah. what I mean? If you really are not believing what you're putting out there. Um, so I'm really not an advocate of consciously being fake, <laughs> but I would say it's more about truly knowing or knowing ourselves and building up that confidence from, um, I have this daily through two one exercise that I recommend. It's in the book as well. And it's uh, 30 minutes of reading and followed by 20 minutes of journaling and 10 minutes of meditation. And basically what that does every day, I prefer doing it before bed. Some prefer to do it first thing in the morning, kind of whatever suits your schedule, but it's, it's an hour to get really um just relaxed and you know the 30 minutes of reading is reading just for fun so that's your input sort of entertainment and then uh journaling it's output and that in certain parts of our lives we can have an aversion to journaling because sometimes the emotions that or the thoughts we have ruminating in our heads we don't want to put on paper because we think oh that'll make it more real when really it can give us an opportunity to do uh engage in what is called narrative therapy which is Literally, if there's something, uh, let's say a situation in your mind or a relationship that you can't stop thinking about, it can be really helpful to, again, have a healthy distance and write about the situation like you're a character in a story and, uh, and just to know what the narrative is instead of second guessing and questioning, wait, how did it go? And then maybe even rewriting the narrative and saying, oh, well, next time this is how I would handle it and practicing that self-forgiveness or whatever is needed. Um, and then, you know, followed by that 20 minute session of, of journaling, that output, then, um, meditation is really an opportunity to say, okay, I'm just clearing the air, clearing some space. And uh, there's a technique called the four, the breath of four, four, four. It's uh, a, a really classic technique where you'll breathe in through your nose for four counts and hold, and then exhale through your mouth for four counts. And, and repeating that for 10 minutes is one of the most soothing, anxiety reducing things that, that you can do. That's really easy. Um, just to, just to do, even if you are, are in public, you know, it's something that you can kind of find a bench and sit down and do. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, uh, I've had a journaling daily journaling practice for at least 12 years now, but Mm -hmm. until that time I resisted it for at least 12 years. Mm -hmm. Um, so many counselors and therapists told me to journal and all in my mind, it was just, you know, little girl with, you know, my little diary princess pony kind of glittery thing. I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing a diary. That's ridiculous. But but one thing that that um, amazes me about journaling is that, yeah, getting it out of your head helps and, and onto paper. And the journal doesn't judge back. Mm. Like it's, it, there's, 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 just, there's just no fear. Once you get into that habit, there's no, there's no downside. There's no, oh, no, now I wrote it. Like there's never been, crap, I wrote that down. I can't believe it. Now it's turned into reality, you know, whatever, you know. Because um, I even, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll do like dark pages and like, um, mm-hmm really vent in a journal and it's just everything I hate about myself and it's I'll even make a ritual and like destroy that and burn it and and do things like that but yeah uh, journaling there's there's no limit to what you can do with journaling and and meditation because Mm -hmm. meditate it's easy as you know three deep breaths at every stoplight you know you you can right everywhere yeah yeah and I I appreciate what you brought up in terms of journaling um seeing gender it's just kind of like you know there's a lot of talk at least in the tech hub uh, in San Francisco of, let's say, girls not engaging in STEM or math because they think, oh, we're not good at it. And then the kind of reverse of that that could be talked about more is how men are, men are, excuse me, little boys are discouraged from exploring their emotions and experiencing them and how it, I just think that it's done such a disservice to humanity as a whole to gender emotions <laughs> when sure. they we all feel emotions and um and yeah I, I think if there is that sense of 
fear of judgment of, from others, you know, if someone finds out that you're journaling or if that's a bias that, that you've internalized, you know, that you feel, for example, it, I think it's, it's worthwhile to know that, that this sort of movement, movement is in progress. Um, I think we talked a little bit about The Mask You Live In. Have you heard of that documentary? Um, it, it's about toxic masculinity and this, um, yeah, this whole idea. So I, I should also mention, so I have a twin brother and then I have a, a little brother who's 10 years younger. Uh, and yeah, I've, I've seen firsthand how growing up my, I mean, and honestly, my emotions were not always embraced either, <laughs> but I could definitely tell that my brothers, um, weren't it like it, it did seem much more acceptable for me to cry than my brother to cry. And, and especially during this pandemic, I mean, just allowing ourselves the space to cry. And I'm not saying, you know, get up in front of all of your roommates or your family and just shed tears. Like it can be private and sacred, um, but just allowing ourselves that, that judgment free zone, even if it's just with our own selves, um, to, to just get comfortable with, with that sense of expression. You don't have to tell anyone that you have a journal. It's no one's business. But if it's something that really helps you, and then you feel confident in sharing, it can also help others feel more confident in, um, you know, picking up that journal and getting to work. Right. So, so to get back of, of, of kind of one of the things you said at the beginning of the emotions have surfaced, Mm -hmm. I, I'm allowing myself to discover who I really am and, and what I'm about and par is part of what the fuck do I do with it, <laughs> right. Jour journaling and meditation, right? Not yes. just shunting it. It's really, I, I know it's really back to basics. And I would say there, there's so many, you know, quote unquote, like quick fixes that, that some people are seeking when it comes to self-help or personal development, uh, when really just sort of getting things at, at the core is a, having a sense of clarity on wait, like, how do I feel? And if I know how I feel, then taking that a step deeper and asking, how did I get there? What are the events that either happened recently? And it can even be a micro event that seems, oh gosh, that shouldn't be bothering me. That was so minuscule when really, you know what? It could have touched on a deeper sort of um, wound there from your childhood and it's worth honoring. It's because it's when we stifle that and push it, you know, lower and lower and lower, it doesn't disappear. It primes us for a sort of explosion, which doesn't serve anyone. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned quick fixes and, and I've through my own experience and, and working with people, quick fixes aren't fixes. It's, it's quick, shoving it's quick denials it's it's not even a band-aid it's just mm. I'll, I'll look this way for a while and pretend nothing's happening here right? um because yeah it's especially you know the old wounds old triggers if if we truly allow ourselves to feel what's happening in the moment then that's not a moment that will come back in in distorted triggered by some other event mm. so yeah like what you're saying i like really noticing how you feel and and for me this took a i needed a thesaurus Mm -hmm. What, what are these? I just, I feel gross. What, no, yeah. what, what, what's another word for that? What is, is this as gross as yesterday? No. What is this? And I had to like learn vocabulary for my emotions. But, but again, then how did I get here? And am I really feeling gross about something Stephanie just said? Or am I, mm -hmm. am I living 10 years ago and it, I'm not even present any longer? And, and that's the kind of, it's the non-sexy work mm -hmm. that makes for a long fix. Absolutely. So in times like now where anxiety is on the rise and, and depression can be on the rise, um, mm -hmm. a lot of people that, that are un, got, have become unemployed or fearful about being unemployed, it is, is the whole introvert, extrovert um, division or terminology, is, uh, is either side of that more prone to be more upset, more triggered by, by any of this? So I would say, I would say that all personality identifications are going to have an experience to being laid off, certainly. So, and again, if, if we're going to generalize a little bit more, they'll be affected in different ways. So for example, let's say an extrovert who was really thriving on that social interaction, uh, no longer having, and of course it's very different right now in the age of a pandemic because, um, 
the experience of no longer going into the office is something that people have been experiencing now for, for many months. Whereas pre-pandemic, there would be more of a stark contrast to physically, let's say, getting up in the morning, getting dressed, going into an office and greeting your peers, having meetings in person, even the little things like, you know, a pat on, on the shoulder, like, oh, great job, or how are you, or a high five, uh, you know, that, that human, human interaction, human touch, um, what, with that going away overnight, because typically, I mean, I will say in some situations, um, especially right now, there can be some notice with layoffs, especially those privy to financials, but oftentimes, uh, because for a slew of different reasons, but there could be concern over giving too much notice for, um, you know, IP reasons or productivity, whatever it may be. So oftentimes it's going to be more immediate with less notice. Um, so yeah, just that jolt of, let's say, belonging and then not belonging to a group, being in the in-group and then within a matter of minutes being in the out-group without your consent, <laughs> perhaps, without, um, yeah, th there's a lot of room for more EQ and yeah, emotional intelligence um, in, let's say, the, the, you know, firing, letting go process. Uh, but yeah, so we talked about how an extrovert could be impacted immediately by missing that high level of social interaction that, uh, that most introverts thrive on. And then on the introverted side, I do think that it can go more into um, those feelings of belonging. Let's say, um, let's say that if it, assuming that introverts may have fewer social connections that are closer, then uh, if those did live and exist in the workplace, then yeah, it's certainly an opportunity to reframe the social piece, but also anyone who's been let go now in this pandemic age or previously knows uh, what it can be like, especially when, let's say, you've kind of outsourced your confidence into that role, into that company. And there's this impression that, oh, these are, this is my, my family away from home and, uh, and just getting a lot of gratification from the work that you do and a, a lot of external validation. I know that I certainly experienced that um, when I was let go from a company, oh gosh, four and a half years ago now. And there was just this whole slew of emotions. And I realized, oh shoot, I outsourced my confidence. Mm. And I, I had built it up for myself, but then it became clear when I was let go that, oh my goodness, what, like, what am I going to say when I meet people now, when they ask, what do you do? And it had become such a core part of my identity that it became so clear that I needed to first take the time to grieve that, but then also be really proactive in, okay, let's, let's not sort of wallow in, in that for too long. It's time to uh, really do some soul searching and figure out how can I define myself on my own terms in ways that, um, that are not contingent upon um, a company or a role, even if it's my own. Uh, so that's something that I work with clients on as well. This whole sort of rebuilding that it, it can be so empowering to really think of yourself and what you want to stand for in this life guided by core values. Right. It's important to see yourself as a person with a job, not I am the job, I am the role, or I am, right. I am, an, I am any mask. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I imagine it's this is going to be a harder time than than any time that we've lived through for for getting back into the like we don't know when a job market will come back when when will and it, and it, you know lo losing a job during a hot economy is one thing losing a job when the economy seems to just keep going down and down and down and we don't know what you know the American economy is going to look like uh, a mm -hmm. year from now. Um, do you have any specific advice for for th for this for what seems to be an, an an unusually high level of uncertainty? Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah, so so this is why building a sense of certainty within ourselves is so important because we don't know when the next 
pandemic will hit. I mean, we're in it now, so we can be certain that it's happening now, <laughs> which may not be so reassuring, but it at least, you know, there can be comfort, I know, for some in knowing, okay, the, the standard working environment events will not happen throughout the rest of 2020. You know, pe pe sometimes that can lend a sense of comfort, but, um, but yeah, when it, can you rephrase your question? I want to be sure that I answer it in full. Yeah, it just in any any special tips for someone that that's that's unemployed, look, looking for mm -hmm. work um, yeah. at a time when when uncertainty is just I don't think it's ever been higher. Yeah, so I I would say certainly take advantage of uh, of the resources that are available in terms of unemployment stimulus checks. Those really only go so far. Um, but it will be a great time to do that internal work. And I, I would say, you know, feel free to look at what's available, leveraging your network. Let's say if there's a dream company, now is the time. I don't think it's the time to take whatever you can get unless you really, you know, need that income and aren't able to take advantage of those resources available. But um, if you can, just make sure that you take this time to clarify what dreams have I been deferring? How have I been settling maybe in my career or in other facets of my life? And this is a time where we can begin to step up and step into our most, what feels most authentic, not only authentic, but just, you know, just the version of ourselves that is who we are meant to be. Because on a fundamental level, let's say at that job that I was in uh, four and a half years ago, I was very clear on the fact that, okay, this, it felt like a stepping stone. It did not feel like my life's purpose and it wasn't. <laughs> so even taking the time to reframe and not put the job on a pedestal and say, oh, because you know, this position or this boss didn't either see my value or Maybe it's just the economy and, you know, the economy wasn't able to provide the company I was at with enough resources to have this job persist. Again, depersonalizing when we can, because oftentimes it's really not a direct jab to us personally. It, it's just a circumstance that we're in and we can personalize it because it feels so personal to us. Um, but yeah, taking that time and again, yeah, to get clear on where you'd like to go, dreams you've deferred, like what would your life look like from the time you wake up in the morning? Uh, like what would you have for breakfast? Would you work from home? Would you work outside of the home? This is the time to get really clear. And again, maybe a journal prompt could come into play here where we are outlining what our dream life looks like. And that does encompass a job and the sorts of tasks that you're doing. Uh, because I think that there can be this, um, this desire to pay your dues and then maybe eventually one day you'll get to a higher place, but there could be a lack of clarity about what that even looks like. So sometimes we can plug ourselves in to these jobs and then we realize, wait, I'm actually not appreciated <laughs> year after year, or I don't feel like I'm growing. So making sure that especially when we're in times like this that are very uncertain, that can feel disempowering in many ways, that we're, we're deciding to take ownership of what we have control over, which is the power of our mind. <laughs> and it's way easier said than done, but there are so many books and resources and even going, getting back to basics, having the ability to journal and get that sense of crystal clear clarity of what we want our lives to look like because it could be a blessing in disguise that you no longer have that job. Right. Yeah. I'm, uh, I've always been amazed, but especially now it's happening more and more often. How many people had a job they didn't like, they openly talked about how miserable they were and then they lose it and they freak mm -hmm. out. It's like, yeah. well, wait, you didn't, didn't you kind of get what you wanted? Well, you know, and it's like, and almost right. that suddenly that freedom and the ability to create what they want next is, is mm -hmm. more than they were prepared for at least. But um, are, do you come across that? Do you, that are people that, you know, weren't yeah. happy in the job, but still don't even realize when it ended that they they don't, they can't take advantage of it quite right away. 
Yeah. So, so I, I'd say that's a multifaceted situation, certainly. So yeah, th there can be someone who is not totally happy in the job that they're in, but it doesn't feel bad enough to leave. Maybe this individual is comfortable with either mediocrity or less than healthy circumstances in other areas of their lives. So yeah, complaining can be a habituated way of being in the world. And and that's actually how a lot of people can forge relationships or continue relationships based on shared pain points. And I, I would highly discourage that. I mean, if it feels authentic for you, express yourself. But if you're finding that you have nothing but negative things to say about your, your job or about your spouse or whatever the topic of conversation is, um, it can be scary, but so empowering to be aware and to consciously make changes, uh, a, a really big one is maybe not listening to as much top 40 radio and seeking out listening to music that has positive lyrics because that's subconscious programming right there. Mm -hmm. When we're listening to, let's say, all of these, um, these songs on the radio, uh, you know, if we even listen to the radio anymore, now what is it? It's Spotify, it's Pandora. <laughs> I know. Um, I'm like, yeah, get your radio out. But uh, but yeah, just taking control and ownership. And when I start conversations, especially in a networking capacity, but then again, how I define networking, it's pretty much when you're out in the world interacting with, with people that you know well or don't know at all. So I, I tend to begin conversations with a comment that is positively skewed. So instead of commenting on, oh, isn't, isn't it horrible that we have to wear masks? For example, that could be a conversation starter these days. Um, a, another conversation starter that could serve us better is what's a new hobby that you started during quarantine that you wouldn't have started otherwise? And you can get some really interesting responses to that. And again, we're choosing to, um, to focus on the sort of sunnier, more optimistic side and what we give our attention to grows. So, so yeah, that's kind of, uh, there, there are several tips in there for, yeah. for people who are looking to make the most out of this time if they have been laid off. So with, with all the, the, the study and the growth and coaching over there's, do you see, do you define yourself now as an introvert or extrovert? Yes. Okay. So I, um, I'm an introvert, but that being said, I am, I'm definitely not 100% introverted. I'm not, it's not like, Oh, I just need to be reading and I I'm hating this conversation right now. I can't wait until we get out of here. That's not it at all. I I'm a little bit more on the cusp. So, but I am more introverted. And, uh, what's been so interesting is Again, just being misconstrued, the way I show up is confident because I do feel a sense of confident and confidence and people oftentimes convoluting that with, oh, if you are showing up in this way that's excited to be speaking with a group of people or um, you know, doing something that's public facing, it, it just means that maybe it's in alignment with core values. That can be super exciting to know that the sort of work that you're doing and how you're spending your time in this life is what you're meant to be doing with certainty. There's something really exhilarating about that and, and it can take some work to get there, but when you get there, it's, it's really great. And, it, and at that point, the introvert extrovert conversation really melts away and it comes down to being fueled by something deeper and greater than that. Yeah, it's like you, you are embracing your authentic self and you can be fueled in a number of different ways. Yes, exactly that. Cool. Cool. So the confident introvert that this is your first book. Yes. And I can even show you what it looks like. I'm curious. It's <laughs> I, know. <purple. laughs> I know it's, it's purple and blue. So here it is my book, baby. And, and how, how new is this? So it came out June 15th. Oh, so yeah, it's, it's still fairly new. I'd say. Yeah. Cool. I, I wrote it. Um, I wrote it in, November and December of, of 2019. And then, yeah, the incubation period wasn't as long as a normal baby, but it, it's out there. It's out, out and about. <laughs> cool. Cool. So, t so tell me a little bit more about it. Is it, is it really focused on networking, job hunting, or is it more introvert, extrovert personality type? Like, yeah. It? So let's see. 
I, I'll read the table of contents to give you a better idea. So the first chapter is identify, understand your personality before meeting others. Then we go into recharge, manage your energy to avoid burnout. Then reframe, shift your mindset for an empowering experience. Then we go into relate part one, meeting new people in real life. And then what's a little more relevant right now, part two, strike up conversations online. And then we wrap up with re-engage, nurture your relationships for lasting connections. So, you know, it is about networking, but I would say, as you can probably tell from the title of those chapters, it, it goes deeper than that. So uh, my sort of way of looking at things is there are three main tiers. So let's say we're focused on human connection, but then how do we get to human connection? Below the surface of, of that is feeling confident enough to connect with others. And then how do you feel confident? Below the surface of confidence is reducing anxiety because how can you feel confident if you're second guessing yourself and experiencing that social anxiety. So, uh, so another hat that I wear is I'm a meditation facilitator and I facilitate these deep meditation experiences that help people alleviate anxiety long term. So it's really holistically focused. It, um, the book focuses on there are um, on sort of, again, like reducing that anxiety, building up confidence, and then building up connections that feel that feel really good and that um, help us in our careers, but also um, just in a way that feels really aligned. Cool. Yeah. One thing I'm really noticing there's a lack of um, these days is, is hope. This would be a lot of despair, a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry and concern. So I'd like to ask what you are hopeful about. Yes. Okay. So I am hopeful that this pandemic will allow us as a collective to be more aware than ever that we are a part of a collective because uh, yeah, as, as Americans, it, it, read it, open up any sociology book and you'll see uh, individualistic society, right? Uh, so this is an opportunity to let us know that we are all working together to help eradicate and control this pandemic. We are all working together to help uh, rebuild the economy and keep, you know, certain, our favorite restaurants open and, and little things like that. But at a fundamental level, knowing that it starts with us, but we are a part of, of something greater. So I know that when it came to, uh, to my own work, I had branded myself as an in real life connection advocate. And I really stood for, oh, in real life, that's, that's the way to go. I don't want to deal with this tech stuff because it just gets in the way of connection when, you know, couldn't have necessarily foreseen that in real life would no longer be an option. And now that it's no longer an option, I've been able to dig below the surface. And, you know, instead of being distraught, like, oh, what I built my business on is going away. It's like, oh, well, actually, I realize now I never really stood for in real life. Below the surface of that was uh, feeling really whole on our own so that we have more to give to others. And yeah, that sort of service component was what was um, sort of, below the surface, but it's almost like situations like these that are really uh, consuming and big and pervasive and just the sorts of things that you can't ignore that are changing our reality right now and perhaps um, indefinitely certain aspects of it. It's an opportunity to reevaluate and assess what we value and what we stand for and empower ourselves to acclimate and thrive in a new reality that is just so different. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. W what's the best way for people to uh, reach out to you, find out what you're up to, Stephanie? Yeah. So I would say uh, if you go to stephanietoma.com, that's where everything lives. So that's S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E. T-H-O-M-A. Uh, certainly check out Confident Introvert on Amazon.com. Simple search. It'll pop right up. And then I also have a free networking remotely resource sheet. It's at stephanietoma.com slash freebie. And then of course, I'm on the social media channels. Um, I'm most active on Facebook and Instagram. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, we'll have links to all those on in the show notes for this episode at realmenfield.org. If you 
if you didn't capture all that, if you didn't just uh, download immediately and, and sign up for everything that Stephanie's up to, we'll, uh, we'll help you out uh, after the fact as, as, you, as you digest this episode. Um, I really want to thank you for your time today. And uh, I've really learned a lot and, and opening my mind up of what an introvert and extrovert is. And, you know, I've worked as an energy coach for, for over a decade and I've never heard introvert and extrovert put into energy terms as, as to where you get your fuel. So I, I really, uh, I really, I really like that aspect of it. Yes. Thank you so much, Andy. This has been a really, really fun convo. Thank you for having me. Good. That, that's the goal. That's the goal. If, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm often surprised. We, we didn't go there here, but I'm often surprised how often um, I'll have a conversation about, you know, suicide attempts with somebody, another survivor, and we just laugh up the whole way through it. And it's just like, so bizarre. But uh, there's a fine line between humor and tragedy. Yeah. And, and I find when, when you can step back, witness yourself, laugh at yourself, laugh at traumas, laugh at, you know, what used to just make you lose your mind, literally, um, mm -hmm. that's when you really know that you're, you're healing. So, yes. yeah. So I think uh, I look forward to all the workplace pandemic comedies that come out. Like, what's the uh, yep. the COVID the version office. of the Office? Whatever it's going <laughs> to be. Right? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So, thanks, Stephanie, for joining us. Thanks for everyone else for listening and tuning in. And wherever you are listening, please give a like, a rating, a review. Um, if you really want to show your support for Real Men Feel, visit realmenfeel.org/swag for cool mugs and hoodies with the sexy manly. Warrior Magician Love King logo I recently uh, put together. Other, other coveted items there as well. Uh, and of course, you're listening. You'll really have to visit that site to know what the heck I'm talking about. Um, but you also find us on Facebook. Send us feedback. We'd love to hear what you thought about this show, future shows. And as always, be good to yourself. Thank you for listening to Real Men Feel. Contact us at realmenfeel at gmail.com. Join the private Real Men Feel Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash real men feel. Learn more about author, coach, and healer Andy Grant at theandygrant.com. If you enjoyed this episode, it would help us greatly if you gave a review wherever you are listening right now. It takes less than a minute and helps other people discover real men feel.